And man, I'm sure that there have been times in your life, there have been times in my life when I need God's strength. Uh, maybe you're feeling that even this week. Uh, this psalm, Psalm 61, Pat Vaughn already read it for us, uh, is a psalm of an affirmation of trust. It's all about trust in the Lord. It's a lament psalm, like several of the others we've looked at. There's some suggestion that this psalm was written on the occasion that David uh, was running on the run again uh, when his son Absalom was trying to take the throne from him. So David fled. And uh, there's some similarities uh, between this story and uh, David on the run from Saul. But this particular story can be found in 2 Samuel 15 through 18. Obviously, we don't have time to cover that whole passage this morning. But if you want to read the backstory to why David wrote this psalm, it's in 2 Samuel uh, 15 through 18. Uh, and uh, we see, though, in the life of David, this ongoing trust in the Lord. This, you know, it wasn't just a fleeting thing for David, but he constantly was coming back to his trust in the Lord. Uh, he was a man of great trust, great faith in the Lord. And this comes out in today's uh, psalm. And I think there's some great lessons for you and I in this psalm. You ever find it challenging to trust in the Lord and his sovereign plan? You ever find it difficult just to remain trustful, remain trusting in the Lord through difficulties? And, you know, there's always this human uh, tendency to want to kind of take matters into our own hands, to sort of manipulate things, to sort of uh, wrangle the problems out of God's hands and, and, and fix them for him. That's part of being human. We're independent. We have our own ideas. Sometimes we'd like to do God's work for him. But we could often try to bring about his plan through our manipulations. It's always better to let God take care of his own reputation and ours too. And sometimes that's challenging. I think that's kind of the background to this psalm, Psalm 61. Uh, I've given you the outline, uh, the cry for help, verses 1 to 2, uh, the confidence in God and petition, uh, 3 through 7, and the commitment to loyalty, uh, finally in verse 8. It's a perfect sermon, right? Three C's. Uh, we always like our sermons when they uh, have these alliterations, but um, anyway, uh, there's your three C's for the morning message. Let's talk about the cry for help, verses 1 through 2. What's the experience that David's going through? Like, what are the emotions? We know the background is probably the situation with Absalom, uh, but what emotions and frustrations is David feeling? And maybe see if you can relate uh, to some of this. In Psalm 61, 2, he talks about feeling at the ends of the earth. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. David's uh, prayer is coming from a place of feeling isolated. He's feeling like he's at the end of the earth far away from God. And this is one of the reasons that it's thought that this has to do with the situation when he had uh, fled, uh, running from Absalom, uh, because of uh, that situation. A lot of what we read this morning will just fit right into what David was experiencing. But he's feeling alone. He says he has a faint heart. And uh, he's experiencing some pretty deep emotions here. He's crying out to the Lord. Have you ever felt like you were calling out to the Lord from the ends of the earth? Have you felt that way? Like, I just feel distant from the Lord. Like, the Lord isn't hearing my prayer. Or, you know, feeling like God is so far away. Have you ever felt estranged from God? Maybe even when you needed Him most. If so, Psalm 61 is for you. Uh, it's all about feeling isolated from the Lord. And in verse 2 also, David's plea is that he would be led to the rock that is higher than I, he says. What does that expression mean? Well, rock denotes a place of strength and safety. David recognized, though, he couldn't reach it by himself. He's asking for God's help to lead him there. 
to find that rock, that place of strength. If your Bible has cross-references, I'm guessing that you will see there are two other passages from Psalms. Psalm 18.2 and 94.22. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. David is exhibiting here this lifelong trust. This is another place in Psalms. Another one is in uh, 94, 22. But the Lord has become my fortress and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. So what is it that we take refuge in when we're going through difficult times? We take refuge in our own strength, or do we take refuge in the rock that is higher than I? When I lived in Minnesota, I wanted to put a driveway in. I couldn't really afford to um, do a whole concrete driveway. It was kind of a long driveway. So I figured out a way that if I did brick, that I could do it myself, and I wouldn't need to hire a company to come in and do concrete. And uh, there was a place in my driveway, though, uh, where I would walk down to uh, the garage, and uh, the clothesline was strung across the driveway. And I would walk down to the garage under the clothesline. And one winter day, I was walking down to the garage, and uh, the clothesline took my hat off. And I thought, I've walked under this a hundred times. Why did this clothesline take my hat off? And I looked down, and the ground I could see was bulged up. And there was a crack in the ground this wide. I didn't know what this was. It was very strange. I went in the house and got a yardstick, and I, I let that yardstick down in the crack, and it went all the way down. If I let it go, I wouldn't have gotten the yardstick back. That deep. Well, a friend of mine informed me that this is what they call in northern Minnesota a frost boil. There's a place under the ground where water gets trapped, and then in the winter it freezes and pops, just like the ice cubes in our freezer. And uh, so I thought, well, there's something down there. I need to dig down and pull it out and get rid of this frost boil or it's going to crack the driveway when I put it down. And as I started digging, uh, I, I don't know that I ever found the frost boil, but I found a rock. And you know how when you're digging and you find a rock and you think, well, I'm going to dig around this. And then you're wondering, like, how big is this thing going to be? And it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And over several weeks, this hole was getting bigger in my yard. And finally, I got all the way around the edge of this rock, and it was, I'm not kidding, this big around. And I had to have lots of help to get that thing out of there, but I knew I probably needed to get the rock out. So I got it out, put it in the yard as a nice ornament, and it stayed there till, till we moved. I'm sure it's still sitting in that same spot. Uh, but I got that out and uh, never had problems with that frost boil. We know that rocks aren't easily moved, right? Rocks are not... Uh, something you want to tangle with. They're solid. They're heavy. God is described here as the rock that is higher than I, David says. Doesn't it make sense that God would be referred to as a rock? This is a common uh, imagery in Scripture. It shows up numerous places. I had a whole list of Scriptures, and I thought, there's no way we're going to be able to go through all these Scriptures that describe God as a rock. But I just pulled a couple. One of them is Psalm 31, 2. It says, Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Often, when uh, God is described as a rock, it comes parallel with fortress, rock and fortress. And that is the God that we trust in. Uh, we all sang the song when we were little. I'm sure the wise man built his house upon the rock. Remember that song we used to do like this? Uh, that actually comes from a passage in Matthew 7. And uh, we have enough time. I think I'd like to read that whole passage. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. I need to be reminded of this again and again, that if I build my house on a strong foundation, the foundation of the Lord, it's going to last. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. 
and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. We used to go down to Galveston uh, on vacation. I used to have staff retreats down there in a beach house. And uh, there's a deal in Texas when uh, the water washes away the sand to a certain point, if it uh, encroaches and begins to get under the foundation of your house, uh, they will come and declare it, uh, what do they call that? When you, when you de declare something unlivable anymore, condemn. They would come and condemn the house because it had been washed under the foundation. And we saw several houses along the beach that were about to be condemned because the water was washing away at the foundation. And the people had all kinds of tricks like putting tires up against the side of the house and going down to the beach and carrying more sand up to stave off what was happening. That's what happens when you build your house upon the sand. But when we build our house upon the rock, it can withstand all the storms that come our way. I love Psalm 62, 5 and 6. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Uh, does that verse sound familiar to anybody? That's our church theme verse. Thank you. Somebody reads the newsletter. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, that's our, our theme verse. All about trusting in the rock. Trusting in something that's solid. Something we can depend on. We find our rest and our hope in God. Truly, he is our rock and our salvation. Our fortress will not be shaken. Then David goes on to the next C, the confidence in God. It's in verses uh, 3 through 7. A tower of strength in verse 3. You have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. Your Bible might say enemy against the enemy. And we know that's talking about not just the physical enemy, but that David saw behind the physical enemy a spiritual enemy, the evil one. David was very aware that in his role as the king of Israel, that he was not only in a, in a, a political role, but he was in a spiritual role as Israel's leader. This is one of the themes that we keep running into in this psalm series, the difference between living in a righteous way and living in a wicked way. The upright will find their strength in God, but the wicked will turn to their own devices, schemes, and wicked ways. There's a, a proverb, a uh, chapter in Proverbs, Proverbs 18. It has some of my favorite Proverbs. And this will kind of get us off track a little bit, but it's okay. Stick with me here. Uh, I just wanted I, I just wanted the opportunity to read some of my favorite Proverbs. Uh, chapter 18 is loaded. If you haven't read Proverbs 18 lately, it's worth a read this week. Uh, these are some of my all-time favorite Proverbs. So kind of follow with me. Proverbs 18.1. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends, and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. And then there's Proverbs 18.5. It is not good to be partial to the wicked and so deprive the innocent of justice. Then there's Proverbs 18.12. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Sounds like pride comes before the fall, right? Then Proverbs 18.17. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. And we see that in life all the time. Somebody spouts something that sounds true until somebody else comes along and says, let's take another look at this. And then uh, one of my real favorite ones, Proverbs 18.2. This is for the married guys. Uh, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Uh, if you're married, uh, I hope this week you quote that to your wife. Proverbs 18, 24, another one of my favorites. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So in chapter 18 of Proverbs, you're probably like, where's Doug going with this? Here's the thing. Proverbs 18 has some, some of my favorite wisdom 
from the whole book of Proverbs. But the interesting thing is that right in the middle of all these nuggets of wisdom is Proverbs 18.10. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a fortified power. The righteous run to it and are safe. I think the wisest of all wisdom is this fear of the Lord, this trust in the Lord, that he is a strong tower. He is the rock. We can trust in him. We can run to him and be safe. Is there really any solution to our problems more potent than our God? There is no solution that is strong, stronger than our God and able to take care of the things that trouble us. And what is it that separates the righteous from the wicked, as it talks about in Proverbs? What is the, the, the line of demarcation? What is the thing that separates the righteous from the wicked? It really comes down to pride, I think. Thinking that we're the solution to our problems. That all the solutions we need are just within ourselves. That's really prideful thinking. Thinking that we are the strong tower. Instead of having confidence in God as the strong tower. Some problems that we experience are just simply beyond human understanding or help. Beyond human solution. I've experienced some of these myself recently. And you have to. Sometimes there just isn't a human solution to problems. I mentioned last week that Psalms are vertical. They talk about our relationship with the Lord. And Proverbs are more horizontal. They're practical. How to deal with people. How to live with one another. How to live in a wise way. And it's interesting when you think about it, because Solomon, who wrote most of the Proverbs, uh, was the son of David, who wrote most of the Psalms. And so Solomon probably grew up hearing Psalm 61 and other Psalms like it. And so he knew about the relationship of these Psalms and how they express a cry to the Lord. And Solomon wanted to put these statements down in a way that would help us live wisely with one another. And doesn't it make sense that Solomon, having grown up in David's house, would have gained some wisdom how to handle problems, how to relate with other people? Because he was shown this example from Psalm 61 by his father. You know, I want to make a comment. This may be a bit of a sidetrack. But having read this far in the psalm, we realize that David is away from his throne but he's taken refuge in the Lord. You get the sense that he's removed himself from the battle, but has hidden himself in the Lord. He was actually challenged, both about Saul and about Absalom, by his own people to take that situation, in both of those situations, into his own hands and to figure out a way to solve the problem on his own. And in both situations, he refused. And he decided to allow God to handle the problem, to handle the situation. So we see David away from his throne, having removed himself from the battle. But this psalm is all about him hiding himself in the Lord, taking refuge in the Lord, the Lord who was his strong tower. And here's an observation from that. Sometimes we must remove ourselves from the battle and get out of the fray of the conflict and get alone with the Lord in order to be found hidden in the shelter of his wing. I want to say that again. Sometimes we have to remove ourselves from the fray of the battle and get alone with the Lord in order to be hidden in the shelter of his wing. Sometimes we just got to say, I'm not going to fight this battle. I'm going to let the Lord fight this battle. And that's what we see David doing in this circumstance. Now, to be sure, Hiding in the shelter of the Lord's wing is not avoiding problems. It's not, it's not hiding from the problem, but it's taking refuge in the Lord. Now, conversely, if we're putting ourselves into the battle and taking up arms, we're not trusting in him to fight the battle. 
or trusting in our own strength. Sometimes having faith in him means we must trust in his strength and take ourselves out of the battle. Think about the battles in the promised land, you know, leading up to the promised land and the initial battles of the promised land. One of my first sermon series here at One Hope Community Church was about the promised land battles. So this is kind of in the back of my mind this morning. But you'll remember that in those initial battles in the promised land, there were strict instructions for the Lord on how to fight the battle. That the battle was to be the Lord's, not the people's. That the Lord would be the one who fought the battle. He required the people to follow all of his instructions, even when sometimes it didn't make sense to them. And I think even in that, there is a bit of a commentary on our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes things just don't make sense. Sometimes we can't understand why things are the way they are. Well, let's keep trudging along through Psalm 61. We come to verse 4, and here's the heart of David's lament. This is the key passage for Psalm 61. Uh, David is declaring his desire to dwell in the tent of the Lord forever and take refuge in the shelter of the wind. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wing. What does it mean to dwell in God's tent? Well, we know this is figurative. It exhibits a deep desire to dwell in God's presence, to be alone with God, to feel his love and his security, to let him protect us. It also insinuates an obedience of the Lord. So we're not working against the Lord, but we're cooperating with him. We're saying, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? How would you have me proceed? And notice that David's desire to be found in the security and protection of the Lord is sandwiched between his human cry for help and his commitment to loyalty. So David is not like running away from the situation. He's crying out to the Lord, telling the Lord, about his troubles. But here in the middle of it is his declaration that he wants to take refuge in the shelter of his wing and to dwell in the tent of the Lord forever. David just touches on the result of this in verse 5. Verse 5 says, For you, God, I have heard my I have heard my vows. For you, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. This could be a whole sermon right here, verse 5. The result of trusting in the Lord. This is the sowing and reaping we talk so much about. That we really do in life reap what we sow. And here David is asking, uh, knowing that the Lord has heard his vows, to give him the heritage of those who fear his name. The heritage of those who fear his name. That could be a whole series of sermons about the blessings of obeying the Lord and following him. And then David gets down to the specifics in verses 6 and 7 of his petition. He prays for three things. He prays for, well, let's read uh, verses uh, 61, 6 through 7. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May, be enthroned, may he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. So he's praying for three things. That God would prolong his life. Secondly, that God would extend his reign. And third, for the blessings of loving kindness and truth. Your, your Bible might say faithfulness. Uh, the New American says loving kindness and truth. David's asking, first of all, that his years would be as many generations that God would extend his life, give him long life. Scripture tells us that those who fear the Lord will be blessed with long life. Many times in the wisdom literature we see this. And these verses show that David recognized the Davidic promise, the promise that there would be a Messiah sitting on that throne one day. David recognized his place as a, sort of a forerunner, to the Messiah, and knew all about these promises, and yet 
he still prays this prayer that the Lord would extend his life and extend his reign. He never took it for granted. Uh, it's actually mentioned in, or it's uh, described in 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 17. I think I've given you that in the notes. Uh, if you go to the church app, you can access the notes. And if you want to read that this week, I think you can click on it. And I think that whole passage will come up. Uh, but that's where the history behind this Davidic covenant is. And David knew this. And he carried on in such a way that showed he knew this. But he never took it for granted. He's asking the Lord to extend his reign and that God would prolong his life. And imagine what that must have been like for David. What a great promise about the Messiah coming along after him. You know, David must have had such great confidence because he knew about this. You know, no running for re-election for David must have been pretty freeing. Still, I think it required faith for David to trust in the Lord and to be obedient and continue trusting and being faithful. Even though he knows that he has the promise from God about his throne, he doesn't ever take it for granted. He is dependent on God to prolong his reign. Uh, this comes out also in Psalm 40, verse 11. Do not withhold your mercy from me. Lord, may your love and faithfulness always protect me. Uh, this, there's another psalm, we don't have time to read it, but I think I put it in your notes, it just mentioned there. Uh, psalm 89 talks all about this covenant. Maybe you want to read that also this week. But I ask myself this question. Is all of this with David, knowing that there was a Messiah King coming along, a precedent for you and I? Like, is there something in David's trust in the Lord uh, that has an impact for you and I or has meaning for you and I? Or is that sort of a separate thing? You know, like David uh, being in the line of the Messiah, is that just sort of separate theological information and it doesn't impact us at all? I think it does. So you and I are not in the kingly line. We should see ourselves as integral to God's plan. That God has a plan for this world, and he's working it out. And even when things around us look bleak, when the world around us looks like it's falling apart, we can have confidence in God's plan and know that he has us in that plan, that he has a part in that plan for us. Well, then in verse 7, David prays for the blessing of loving kindness and truth. Why would he pray for truth? Almost seems kind of out of place here. I mean, loving kindness, I understand. Everybody wants there to be more love, right? Uh, you know, uh, the Beatles, they sang about it, right? They said, all you need is love, but then they broke up. <laughs> but David here wants his reign marked by God's loving kindness and truth. Why is he asking about truth? And then I have to wonder, do I ever pray for this? Do I ever pray for my life to be marked by God's truth? Do we ever pray for our various roles and relationships, maybe our work relationships or our family relationships? Do we ever pray that those would be marked by truth? In a sense, we are all defined by God's calling upon our lives. We're sort of, in a sense, defined by what God has called us to do, the lot in life in which he's placed us. Our identity is, in part, what he has created for us. This is one of the issues we talk about with men a lot, that men get so buried in their careers and their identity, their career becomes part of their identity, and then when retirement comes, don't know what to do because my whole identity was in my job. That's why it's important to distinguish between vocation and career. We talked about this when we did our series on work. That career will only last so many years, but our vocation will last a long time. Uh, the vocation is God's imprint on our lives and how he's called us to serve one another, how we respond to others. It has to do with our ministry on this earth. 
and how we impact the people around us. Well, according to verse, according to Psalm 61, who is it that can pray for truth? Who is it that can pray this prayer that David is praying? I think it's those who are not playing fast and loose with the truth. If you're operating in any way less than truthful, you cannot ask God to mark your relationships and leadership roles with truth. This is one way we can place ourselves in the shelter of his wing by operating in truth. Uh, remember that lament psalms are all about trust and trusting the Lord. And you can't have trust without truth. Here's an important observation as we kind of wind down this morning. So I think one of the most important observations after reading Psalm 61. So if you get nothing else from today's sermon, get this. To be sure, it was God's strength that David found under the shelter of his wing. To be sure, it was God's strength that David found when he placed himself under the shelter of his wing. It wasn't his own strength. It wasn't that David, you know, said, okay, Lord, I'm going to hide myself under your shelter, and God gave David strength. But we remember that when we are weak, he is strong. So it was God's strength that David found under the shelter of his wing. It's the rock that was higher than him, the rock that is higher than I. And man, in this world, do we ever need that? We need God's strength. We need something that's more you know, powerful than myself. And it's only God that can offer that in our lives. Well, you may notice uh, in the title of your uh, Psalm 61, if your Bible has these titles there, you'll notice that it says confidence in God's protection. It's God that we need protection from. It wasn't David's strength. It was God's strength. And I know in my life that's what I need is God's strength. Because Doug's strength isn't enough for the situations in our world. Well, he ends with the commitment to loyalty. That's characteristic of the lament psalms, uh, just declaring right at the end, usually, a commitment to loyalty, a commitment to follow the Lord. It's in Psalm 61, 8. So I will sing praises to your name forever, that I may pay my vows day by day. It means that uh, David's saying, I want to live for the Lord day by day, and I will praise, sing praise to your name forever. We saw this last week in the psalm. That in the midst of David's trial, and, and, and get this, that that was a big trial. To be the king and to be run out of uh, your palace, to be run out of uh, the city and from the throne, that was a big trial for David. But he's in the midst of it, praising the Lord. We saw that last week, too. In the midst of our trial, we can praise the Lord in spite of what we're going through. Well. I always like it when the writer of the passage of Scripture gives us the takeaway right there in the passage. And it's there in Psalm 61a. David declares that he would sing God's praises forever. So that's our takeaway for this morning. When we recognize that God's strength is provided for us, our only response is to offer our lives in praise to the Lord.